All right, welcome to the third episode of What is .com's Virtual Book Club. I'm Wes Chai, and with me today are my fellow technical writers, Ben, Alex, Caitlin, and Peggy. In this episode, we will be discussing chapters five, six, and seven of The Phoenix Project, which is a business book about DevOps written by Gene Kim, George Spafford, and Kevin Baer. I found these chapters especially interesting because at this point, we're starting to see concrete growing pains at Parts Unlimited. Um, in chapter five, Bill receives news about an overwhelming amount of IT concerns from a compliance audit report. In chapter six, Bill and the IT department continue to work on change management. Um, in chapter seven, Bill meets this guy named Eric Reed, who's a prospective board member. Eric's a mysterious tech hotshot and also kind of the quintessential odd genius. Um, so yeah, chapter seven ends with Eric whisking Bill away to one of the company's manufacturing plants and he gives him you know, a very Socratic lesson on something that Eric mysteriously referred to as the three ways. I don't understand what the three ways are. Yeah, so I actually wrote the definition for the three ways last month. So I can clear up some of the mystery for you guys. Um, the first way is about workflow. The second way is about feedback loops. And the third way is about creating a culture where employees feel safe experimenting and also learning from failure. So um, in that spirit of experimenting, we are going to try something a little different this week. Um, instead of having everyone pick their own term, Ben and I actually picked five definitions that we, summed, we felt summed up chapters five to seven. And then we assigned them out to team members for analysis. So Alex, you're going first. Which term were you assigned? I was assigned PII, which stands for Personally Identifiable Information. Um, PII is information that can be used to directly identify an individual. So this could be anything from names, addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers. Uh, they're all examples of PII. All right, and how does PII fit in with this week's reading? Uh, it's an important term in chapter five. Um, John Pesch, the chief information officer, shares that the that he completed an important task around PII and Dr. Bullet, but instead of saying good job, Nancy Miller, who is the uh, chief audit executive, gave him grief about not putting enough information on or uh, enough attention on IT controls. Why does John get so much grief? He gets a I lot. <laughs> I think it's because John seems to be more anxiety prone and he's warning everyone about the dangers around putting PII data protection on the back burner and no one is listening to him. Uh, we learned more in our own corporate training, I think a couple of weeks ago, that um, everyone is responsible for protecting PII and it's not just the chief information security officer's job. So I think this could get pretty interesting. Uh, mostly, I think the authors are hinting here that uh, something, some sort of security event involving PII is going to be a part of the story. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that thought ties nicely into the term that Wes assigned me, which is CISO, which stands for Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, I thought it was really interesting to see how John was characterized in Chapter 5 because uh, one of the first things we learned about him is that he's gained a lot of weight in the three years he's been at Parts Unlimited, and the guy is obviously under a lot of stress. Poor fellow. Yeah. I mean, he kind of slinks around with his three-ring binder and stack of compliance requirements, and people end up intentionally excluding him from meetings. Uh, you can start to see how the lack of employee buy-in on protecting something you all know is really important, like PII, is going to come back and bite them. Um, so it kind of got me wondering whether John is like this because – of his personality, you know, what's happening to him, or is it just his job? Like, is it a Myers-Briggs thing where nobody's appreciating, appreciating John because of his quirkiness, so they leave him out, or are they hiding from him because they just have too much work to do and they think of John as a bottomless pit of nitpicking compliance requirements? I think that's a good question, because in my experience, CISOs have a lot of power. So can we be sure that John isn't just building walls up on purpose so he can hold on to as much power as possible? Yeah, so Ben, the term you assigned me was information silo. And I actually, whether that could also be part of John's problem too, because, you know, I just get the sense that he doesn't seem very personable. And, you know, I'm wondering, could he be reluctant to tear down silo walls because maybe operating in a silo makes him feel safe? That's a good point. I haven't thought of it that way before. I, I, I just figured that John had no idea how the long list of things he wants done impacts other people's jobs. 
Yeah, right. Um, it's kind of funny too, because rent is always in demand to fix this and that for everyone. And then on the other hand, people are, you know, perpetually trying to swat John away from whatever they're doing. Right. And at, at first they kind of seem like opposite characters, but actually they have a lot in common because they're both bottlenecks that are preventing the Phoenix project from moving ahead. Yeah, that's actually an important concept in this week's chapters. Uh, because Brent seems like the person who's going to save the Phoenix project moving forward because he's the only one who knows what to do and how to fix things. But it actually turns out uh, that he becomes the term we assigned Peggy this week. What's that? Bottleneck? Yes, sort of. In project management, a bottleneck is called a constraint. It's ironic because I mean the one guy who knows everything is actually slowing down progress on Parts, Un Parts Unlimited's most important business goal, which is releasing the Phoenix Project on time. So until they can figure out a way to stop people from bothering Brent, is the Phoenix, Phoenix Project doomed? If you believe in the theory of constraints, yes. Everything is going to have to move as fast as Brent can move. But isn't the theory of constraints a lean manufacturing thing, like Toyota production system or total quality management? Nope. And Alex already mentioned in the book, um, the authors seem to be using foreshadowing. And um, I think their real gift really is how they're using metaphors between uh, IT and the manufacturing plant to show the reader how one concept relates to another. It's pretty easy to understand the concepts behind lean production as Eric is walking Bill through the products and limited factory floor. And I think it's gonna be interesting to learn how these ideas translate into IT. Yeah, I hope we learn more about Eric. He's I do. I mean, he's an interesting guy. <laughs> I feel like there's so much to talk about. We could even do like, we can talk about him the full episode, but Sadly, that's not going to be today because we're almost out of time. So based on the way chapter seven ended with Eric walking Bill through the parts of Limited Factory, what do you guys think will be an important term for chapter eight? Based on the factory tour, I think it's gonna be lean production. That's a good one, but didn't chapter seven end with Bill struggling to remove his laptop's battery uh, because an alarm was going off? Yep, that's right. And at this point in the book, Bill's replacement laptop has, you know, more or less taken a life of its own and even become a character. So, I don't know, does this mean our next week's word should be crap top? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stick with lean production. All right then, well, thanks for joining us and be sure to check out the free online study resources we've been creating for this book on whatis.com. I promise you won't see crap top there and see you soon. <laughs>